Good morning, Northgate. Welcome to the live stream. Uh, well, not live stream. It's pre-recorded. Um, still figuring out some of the stuff, getting everything uh, up to snuff so we can live stream it. But, uh, I don't know how to say it. So yeah, my name's Garrett. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm the youth pastor here, and I have got some announcements for you guys. So if you are watching this right now, you're not here in person. But if you are planning on being here in person, uh, you'll need to register. So you can register through the website. Uh, there, there's a link there. Uh, we go through Eventbrite, but we are cutting back. We're kind of limited to uh, a few less people. We've found we've had uh, a little bit of trouble with the current amount that we have limited to. And uh, yeah, so we're, we're really needing to cut back the numbers a little bit. And so if you're planning on coming, make sure you register. If you don't register, there is a pretty good chance we might have to turn you away at the door, at which point you pull out your phone and you watch this recorded version of it. Uh, we have a few things. We got uh, Family Matters. There's a Family Matters meeting on October 14th. Uh, if you are a member, it'd be a good idea to come to that. It's been a while since uh, the board and the staff have talked to the rest of the congregation, so Come out to that. That'd be a great time where we can convey information and uh, we can hear from you. And, uh, oh, that's on a Wednesday, so there will be no youth on October 14th. Uh, many of our youth and our leaders are members and should prioritize the meeting. So, uh, and I want to be there too. So no youth on October 14th. Family Matters meeting October 14th. Uh, our condolences to... Virginia P. for the, on the passing of her sister. Uh, it's very tough to lose family. Uh, keep her in, her in your prayers. And uh, yeah, our condolences. We want to publicly thank Ed George for all of his work that he did around the church. Um, we've had a tough time trying to uh, get enough volunteers to cover all the work that he did around here. So thank you so much for your years of work. And uh, yeah, speaking of which, we need volunteers. We need Currently, well, we need someone to change the sign. Um, don't worry, you don't have to come up with the sign. We give you that, and you just have to put the letters up. Uh, we need volunteers. We need male youth leaders for youth. Uh, currently, I'm the only one, uh, but uh, not a volunteer. But you know what? We need a lot of volunteers, so please contact the office. I'm sure even if you can't show up in person, uh, there's some way we can keep you busy. Uh, and for a lot of us, the next step in our Christian faith is to just be involved, is to do something as a church, with the church. So, uh, yeah, do not hesitate. Contact the office. Just ask where you can help. I believe that's it for um, announcements. That looks like it. So uh, I'm just going to close in prayer as we switch over to uh, Rod's Kids Time. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you we can meet. We thank you we have the technology to do this. Um, God, we thank you that we have the resource to do this. God, you've been very good to us in this time, and, and we thank you so much. God, as, uh, we look forward to uh, Mark speaking. God, hearing your word, uh, hearing you speak. We, um, God, we pray that it would touch our hearts, that it would penetrate our minds and, uh, and change our entire being, that we would be transformed. And God, we uh, pray, for, uh, pray for Rod as we hear from him. And um, God, that not only the kids would be blessed, but us as well, as he'll be speaking your truth, and, and we all need your truth. God, we thank you for all these things in your name. Amen. Good morning, friends. It's really great to see you guys this morning. I have a question for you. I want you guys to think about who your best friend is. I'll give you a minute to think about that. 
Well, maybe not a minute, but I want you just to think about the person you want to be with the most, your best bud in the whole world. And why are they your best friend? Do they make you laugh? Do you enjoy playing video games with them or playing in the park with them or coloring? What is it about them that you love? God has given us all friends and we need to cherish them and appreciate them. And I want you to pretend that um, these food items I have here represent people and they are really good by themselves, but they're better when complemented by something else. So for instance, salt. We often put salt on our food, but salt is really goes good with pepper, right? What else complements each other? Let's say peanut butter. You guys like peanut butter? I love peanut butter. Peanut butter goes really, really good by itself, right? Love to eat peanut butter, but it also goes really good with strawberry jam. They complement each other. Like a peanut butter and jelly sandwich tastes so good, right? What else really goes well together? Let's see. Hmm. You guys like milk? Everybody likes a cold glass of milk, right? Well, what about milk and cereal? They really complement each other. Everybody loves cereal, but it doesn't taste that good by itself. It tastes way better with milk, right? Or what about spaghetti? This is one of my favorite meals is spaghetti. Now, if I made the spaghetti and just ate it alone, it would taste pretty dry and not so great. But what goes really well with spaghetti? Tomato sauce, especially with meatballs, right? They really go well together. Oh my goodness, all this food is making me really, really hungry. Hmm, do you know what I really, really enjoy? Is good old oysters. Do you guys like oysters? I love oysters. Yummy. I think, mmm, mmm. Oysters. And do you know what also I really love? Ice cream sandwiches. Ugh. That does not go well together. Oh, sorry. So God wants us to be a good friend to each other. And I'm going to share a Bible verse that talks about this. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 10 says, Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in, is in real trouble. That's a New Living Translation. God wants us to be a good friend to each other. And I think in the Bible of two good friends is David and Jonathan. They loved each other and they complimented each other really well. David and Jonathan loved spending time together. They were there for each other during good times and bad times. And God wants us to be a good friend to people. So how can we be a good friend? We could color them a picture and mail it to them. We could give them a phone call and say, hey, how are you doing? Or we could um, pray for them. Speaking of praying, let's pray together. God, I thank you so much for bringing friends into our life, God. I recognize that every friend I have is a gift from you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you would help me to be a good friend and help all the kids to be a good friend to their friends as well, too. And we pray that you will give us strength to do this. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll see you guys next week. Good morning. Uh, open your Bibles with me to the book of Colossians chapter 2. 
uh, as we are going to be looking at verses 9 to 15. And as you're turning there, um, let me try something with you this morning. Uh, how would you respond if I said, the Lord is risen? Well, he, he is risen indeed. Um, now, how did that make you feel? Uh, chances are it probably felt pretty good, and yet it was probably unexpected because we tend to think of those as Easter Sunday words. But the truth behind those words is an everyday truth and an everyday reality in our lives as believers, that Jesus is alive. And what a difference he makes. And that's really what Paul is talking about as we come to our passage this morning. And this is, this is probably going to feel quite a bit like an Easter sermon because it's all about Jesus. It's all about who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and the difference that the cross makes in our lives. And I think you'll see just what I mean as we read this passage together. Colossians 2 Verses 9 to 15, beginning in verse 9, Paul says this, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And you have been filled in him who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him, through faith and the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespass and your uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Let's pray. Father, just pray you would give us hearts to hear. Uh, minds to focus on you, and Lord, lives that would reflect the truth uh, that we are about to hear this morning. Um, Lord, there's perhaps no more basic and fundamental truth uh, when it comes to the Christian life than what we're about to hear this morning. And yet, Lord, this truth is so foundational and so important that, Lord, even in hearing it again, I pray that it would, uh, it would preach to us like the first time we heard and that our hearts would respond greatly uh, to this good news of salvation that is available to us in Christ Jesus. Um, be with us in our time together. Lord, send your Holy Spirit just to uh, dwell with us and among us and lead us into truth. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So quite simply this morning, I want to begin just by talking about Jesus. More specifically, just the greatness and the fullness of who Jesus is truly is. Uh, there's a poem by a man named S.M. Lockridge called That's My King. And it says this. It says, the Bible says Jesus is the King of the Jews. He's the King of Israel. He's the King of righteousness. He's the King of ages. The King of heaven. He's the King of glory. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's my King. My King is a sovereign King. No means of measure can divine his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially, partially merciful. He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be our all-sufficient Savior. I wonder, do you know him today? Because he's the miracle of the age. He's the superlative of everything good that you can, you can choose to call him. He's the only one able to supply all of your needs simultaneously. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available to the tempted and tried. 
He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleanses the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captives. He defends the feeble. He rewards the diligent. And he beautifies the meek. He's the key to knowledge. He's the wellspring of wisdom. He's the door of deliverance. He's the pathway of peace. He's the roadway of righteousness. He's the highway of holiness. He's the gateway of glory. His life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. His yoke is easy and his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible, he's invincible, he's irresistible. You can't get him out of your mind, you can't get him off your hands, you can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. The Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Death couldn't handle him, and the grave couldn't hold him. He's always been, he always will be. He has no predecessor, he'll have no successor. He's unparalleled, he's unprecedented, he's God's son, he's the sinner's savior. That's my king. And that is who Jesus is. And as that is very much what Paul is saying as we come to verse 9. He just uses fewer words to say it. When he says in verse 9, For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. And this goes to our first point this morning, which is really just understanding the fullness of who Jesus is. And Paul is telling us again that everything that God is, Christ is. Christ is God and the fullness of deity dwells in him. And this is a reflection of his earlier words about Jesus from Colossians 1 verse 15 where Paul says he's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And again, Colossians 1 verse 19, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Jesus is God. He's the Alpha and the Omega, beginning and the end. He's God Almighty, author of life, perfecter of our faith, heir of all things, light of the world, the living stone, the great I am, the resurrection and the light. He's the, the King of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And when the Apostle John saw him revealed on the island of Patmos, we're told that he fell down as though he were a dead man. When Moses saw the Lord in the fire, he hid his face in fear. When Isaiah beheld the glory of God. He said, Woe to me, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. This is Jesus, the one before whom we are told every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. Revelation chapter 5 says, Then I looked... And I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands, and 10,000 times 10,000, and they encircled the throne, and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Awesome is too small a word to describe what it is like to know Christ for who he truly and fully is. That he is the fullness of deity. He is the Son of God. But then, from the fullness of Jesus... Paul then takes us to what I can only describe as the emptiness of humanity in sin. As you skip ahead a little bit in verse 13, he says, And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. You know, trespasses here is just another word for sin. And the Bible has a lot of ugly stuff to say about sin. Sin easily entangles. Sin destroys, sin lies, sin binds us, sin captures us, sin separates us from God, and sin kills. It kills our joy, it kills our peace, it kills our relationship with God himself. And sin, all sin has consequences. And as a pastor, I can tell you the pain that I've seen over the years that sin has caused. 
I've seen marriages end. I've seen, seen children weep. I've seen careers sunk. I've seen friendships unravel, families destroyed, lives devastated. I've seen people lose everything that they care about. All because somewhere along the line, someone thought, what's the big deal about a little sin? But you know, sin is not a shortcut to happiness. It's not a path to getting ahead in life. It's not a means to fulfillment. It won't fill that empty space in your soul. Sin will promise you the world, but it will cost you everything and leave you with nothing but regret and consequences. And yet, for all the pain and sorrow and hardship that sin can bring into our lives, Paul makes it clear in verse 13 that the word that best describes us when it comes to sin is the word dead. That you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. And he says it again. In Ephesians 2, he says, As for you, you are dead in your transgressions and your sins. You see, in sin, we're not just sick, we're not just flawed, we're not just diseased or disabled. We are dead. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23 says, the wages of sin is death. Without Jesus, that is the only outcome for every single one of us because of sin. Death. Rich or poor, famous or infamous alike, we are dead in sin and death is our destiny. And dead is not a good condition to be in. Because being dead in sin means we are lifeless, we are powerless, we are helpless, and we are hopeless. Death means that our sin has broken beyond repair our religion, original relationship with God. Death means we are separated from the life and the holiness of God. Death means that that separation from God is permanent. And that it's both for now and for an eternity in hell. That's what it means to be dead in our sin. And there's nothing we can do to change that. Because we are dead in our sin. So just for imagine for a moment with me that gap between what I just talked about. The gap between the fullness of Christ and the absolute emptiness of being dead in sin. When you realize that distance between those two things, you realize there's no amount of work, no number of rituals, no good deed so noble, no word so eloquently spoken, no well-meaning effort so numerous that any of those things put together could bridge the gap that is now fixed between God and sinful humanity. When Adam sinned in the garden, first sin, that separation that was created by sin became a gulf too large to traverse in this or any lifetime. And that's the bad news. But here's the good news, which is what the word gospel literally means. The good news is that while there was nothing that we could do for ourselves, to save ourselves from the wages of sin, which is death, there was something God could do. Because God refused to let us stay that way. And what what we were powerless to do for ourselves, God did for us. When we were helpless, God came to save us. When we were lost, God came to help us be found. When we were sick, God came to bring healing. When we were dead in our sins and our trespasses, God came to offer us life. Where we fell short, God was the one who made up the difference. And he didn't do it by some act of magic. He didn't just wave a wand and utter some religious abracadabra and poof, sin was gone. No, God fixed it in the only way that he could, the only way possible, by sending his son, Jesus, to die on the cross in our place. As we look at verse 13, again, reading a little further this time, he says, and you who were dead in your sin or your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he says, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of the debt that stood against us 
with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And those are some beautiful words that describe the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. That Jesus would pay the penalty for our sin. He would stand as our substitute. Taking the wrath of God upon himself while hanging on the cross. Our Messiah, our Savior, would lay down his life so that others could find life in him. And he did that even while we were sinners. Even while we were still living in open rebellion to God. Even while we were enemies of God. God sent his only son to pay the price that we could not. Because what the justice of God required, the love of God supplied in Jesus. Jesus, the only worthy and perfect sacrifice. Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus died for sin. Max Lucado writes about that moment in his book, A Gentle Thunder, where he says, God on a cross between two thieves. Exactly the place he wants to be. And for the thieves, a shadow hangs over their spirit. The crowd cringes at the sight of the blood on their skin, but heaven laments over the darkness of their hearts. Earth pities the condition of their bodies. Heaven weeps over the condition of their souls. I wonder if we can even imagine the impact our sin has on heaven. The question is not, couldn't God overlook sin? The question instead is, how in the world is forgiveness an option? The question is not why God finds it difficult to forgive, but how he finds it possible to do so at all. The figure on the center cross, however, has no such shadow of sin. And when one of the thieves makes his request, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The Savior turns his heavy head towards the prodigal child and promises, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. The sin of the thief and all of us thieves, leave him and go to Jesus. Every evil thought, every vile deed, the thief's ravings, his cursings, his greed, his sin, all now covering Jesus Christ. The sin that nauseates God now covers His Son. And at the same instant, the purity of Jesus lifts and covers the dying thief. A sheet of radiance is wrapped around His soul as the one who with no sin becomes sin-filled and the one sin-filled becomes sinless. Just as it says in 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Which is the truth that brings us to the rest of our passage this morning. As I, We want, just want to look at just some of the blessings that Paul mentions in this passage that are now ours because of our salvation in Jesus Christ. The fullness of Jesus now fills us as we are sort of overwhelmed with the benefits of his mercy and grace. And Paul doesn't mention sort of every blessing and every benefit of salvation that is ours, but he mentions a few, and the ones that he mentions here are just beautiful beyond compare. Because the first benefit that he mentions, the first aspect of this fullness of salvation that we have in Christ is forgiveness. You know, there's an old story that describes a scene where Satan is acting as the adversary of believers and how he accuses us before God day and night. That when we sin, Satan rushes to God and says, look what he did. Look what she did. You call them your children, but just look at what they have done. Look at their mistakes. Look at their wrongs. Look at their sins. But just then, as Satan is accusing, Jesus walks up and says, Satan, you're absolutely right. That child of God has sinned, and they've blown it, and they deserve to pay for it. And the wages of sin is death. But the one thing you seem to have overlooked in this case is that these scars in my hand say that it's been paid in full. That's just what Paul means in verse 14 
where he talks about the canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands that he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And I love the language that Paul uses here, saying that the record of our debts is nailed to the cross. Because in the first century, which is Paul's time, if you borrowed a sum of money from someone, they would write up an IOU. And that IOU was a record of debt, just what Paul is talking about here. And it was a binding legal contract. And if you could not repay that debt, it meant imprisonment, it meant slavery, or even death for the person. And yet when that debt that was owed was finally paid off, the creditor would sign their name at the top of the paper. And then they would take that paper and to make it official, they would nail that record of debt either to the, to the doorframe of their house or else somewhere else in a public place that would declare to all who would see it the message that the debt that was owing had been paid. And anyone who would then come to that person and accuse them, or, or if they tried to collect on that debt, all they had to do was point to the nail in the document as proof that their debt had been paid in full. The record of debt was nailed to the cross as proof our debt was paid in full. And as Romans 8.1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because you are forgiven. Completely forgiven of the debt of sin. And then Paul tells us, because of that salvation, we are also found in Christ. This second one speaks really to our identity in Christ. And this is another amazing truth. You know, I had a friend this week. Um, they were talking to me and they said they could not imagine giving up the life of their son in order to save the life of their worst enemy. And yet that's exactly what God does. And he, God takes it one step farther, farther and he begins to welcome that enemy into his very family. You know, God doesn't say when we're forgiven, you know, you're forgiven, just now get out of here. I don't want to see you anymore. God says, you are forgiven. And now you are mine. And in this passage, Paul brings up two symbols. Uh, he talks about circumcision and he talks about baptism. Circumcision was a sign that God gave to Abraham when he made his covenant with him. And, and he gave that to Abraham and to all of his offspring. And baptism is what Jesus gave to us as his disciples. Now, these are both symbols that identify someone as belonging to God's people. They're both symbols that say we have entered into a covenant relationship with God. These are both symbols, circumcision and baptism, that remind us that we now belong to God and are found in Him as His covenant people. We're found in God and our identity is in Him. And I just want to read for you just a reminder of some of the things we are when we are found in Christ. We are chosen of God. We're called the chosen of God. We are children of God. We're called Christ's friend. We're, we're called slaves to righteousness, joint heirs with Christ, members of Christ's body. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit, a dwelling place of God. We're a new creation. We are saints. We're God's workmanship. We're citizens of God's kingdom. We are made complete. We are the salt of the earth. We are light of the world. That's who we are in Christ. That's our identity. And I just hope in understanding that, that we would let that truth speak just to the deepest parts of who we are, that we would embrace it with all of our hearts and just let, let it wash over us as a wave of grace. Let the, your identity in Christ define how you see yourself. And know that you are now one of God's chosen. You are part of his covenant people. You are now found in Christ. And then next, the next blessing we look at is that in Christ we are also formed. Um, you know, going back to circumcision and baptism, um, 
Paul says, you know what, it's not, just, it's not the physical act of circumcision or baptism that does anything. He says it's the spiritual reality of what those things represent that matters. I mean, physical circumcision, it just cuts off some flesh. But spiritual circumcision, which is done by Christ, is the cutting off of the sinful nature from the place of control in our hearts. That's what matters. And physical baptism gets you wet. But the spiritual reality of baptism means that your old nature has died and it's dead and it's buried and you are now alive with Christ. It's about new birth. These are, I think, both fancy illustrations for what a fancy word is, regeneration. That in Christ we are given a completely new kind of life, a new quality of life. A life where the sinful nature no longer controls us and sin no longer masters us. But we are now led and guided, and filled, and transformed by the Holy Spirit. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Because we are formed and transformed by our new life in Christ. And that's not just for the here and now. That's truth that is true for all eternity. Because that leads us to the next lesson. We learn about the fullness of salvation, and that is our salvation is forever. Because you know what? I'm sure someone listening, uh, you know, has probably said, well, if Jesus conquered sin and the wages of sin is death, then why are we still dying? Why does death still happen? We all know death is still a reality that we'll all have to face one day. But you know what? Look at what Paul says again in verse 12. Where he says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God, who raised him from the dead, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. We are made alive together with Jesus through his resurrection. And even now, the resurrection is still a promise to God's people. The promise is that this life is not all that that there is, but heaven is our eternal home. You know, one of my favorite verses, uh, passages is 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. That says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy. He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. In Christ, we can face even the uncertainty of death death with a sense of hope because even death is overcome by the victory of Jesus. Even death is not the end. I love a story about a little boy and his father who were driving down a country road on a beautiful spring afternoon when suddenly out of the blue, a bee flew into the car window. And since the boy was deathly allergic to stings, he became terrified. His father tried to swat the bee out the open window, but only succeeded in making the bee angry and ready to sting all the more. The boy was petrified as the insect buzzed all around him. The father, seeing his panic, his son's panicked face, reached out his hand And simply grabbed the bee in his closed fist. The father waited a moment before opening his hand and releasing the dead bee from his grip. And there still stuck in his hand, stuck in his skin, skin was the stinger of that bee. And the father said, do you see this? You don't need to be afraid anymore, my son, because I have taken the sting for you. And that's such a powerful image of the cross. That's the message of the cross. That's the message of Jesus' resurrection. We don't need to be afraid of death anymore. Christ faced death for us and he overcame it. And he has taken the sting. 
Just as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 55 to 57, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the resurrection and the life and our salvation is something we will have forever in this life and in the next, beyond. And that leads us to this, our next point about our, the fullness of salvation. And that is, our, the fullness of our salvation includes our freedom. Verse 15, Paul says, He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them, uh, by triumphing over them in him. Now when Paul talks here about rulers and authorities. Most people assume he's talking about Satan and the powers of of, of his kingdom. And someone once said that the cross really was Satan's biggest mistake. You know, Satan's hatred for Jesus Christ that sent Jesus to the cross actually became the path of salvation for us all. The cross that was an instrument of death became a symbol of life. The shame that Jesus endured earned our glory. The suffering that Jesus went through becomes our healing. His brokenness now becomes the gateway to us being made whole. The nails that bound him are the nails that earned our freedom. And every enemy, every fear, every obstacle we now face has been overcome in Christ through the cross. Romans 8, beginning of verse 37, says, No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In Christ Jesus we have victory. In Christ the battle has already been won. In Christ we have overcome. And we are set free. Set free from guilt, from fear, from sin, from shame, from discouragement. And even as we heard, we are set free from the fear of death itself. And that life of victory, that life of purity, that life of forgiveness from sin, that hope for eternity, that is for you, that is for me, that is for us all. And we are to take hold of us because it is ours in Christ. And you won't believe the difference if you do, and embrace and live in the freedom that is yours in Christ. And in looking at all of that, all the glories of the fullness of salvation that we've talked about, I hope that you will make it your own this morning, if you haven't already. And that leads us to the final lesson about salvation and the fullness of our salvation. And that is simply that it comes to us by faith. And you know, all that we've talked about today has already been done for you by Jesus. There's nothing left for you to do except simply accept it and believe it. You know, Romans 10 verse 13 says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's the ESV version. NIV puts it like this, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The New Living Translation says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The New Revised Standard Version says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. The New English Translation, the the Holman Christian Standard Version, the Berean Study Bible, they all say it the same because there's no simpler way to say it than everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Because we don't work for our salvation. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to be worthy of it. All we are asked is to believe. Because Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. Our salvation was made complete in him when it was nailed to the cross. And as we come to the Lord's table again this morning, I would ask simply that you come knowing what Christ has done. Come knowing the power of the cross. Come knowing that the cross of Christ offers us 
all of these things, that it offers us forgiveness and belonging and transformation and a sense of our identity and a, and a future and freedom, and that it all comes to us by faith in Christ and nothing more. And that's why we as believers keep coming back to the cross. That's why on the night that Jesus died, he gathered his disciples around him and said, remember this. And he gave them the bread and he gave them the cup as symbols of his sacrifice. Because we're called to never forget the cross of Christ. Because the nails in the cross have become the fullness of our faith. Let's pray. Father God, we are so thankful, so overwhelmed by the goodness that you have shown us that is represented so completely and fully by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross on our behalf. Lord, it's truly amazing that Jesus, who was the Son of God, was willing to go to the cross to pay the price for our sins, a price that we were completely unable to pay in order to bridge that gap to offer us salvation and hope. Lord, may we be overwhelmed by the sheer grace and mercy and truth of that this morning. And Lord, may we all have made that truth our own, that we would believe it through faith and begin to live it out every single moment, every day of our lives, that the fullness of our salvation in Christ would be our treasure, it would be our legacy, and it would be how we live every moment of our lives. And now we come to this table this morning, Lord, pray that you would make our hearts ready to receive um, this cup and this bread as we remember your sacrifice on our behalf. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to take just a short break. Uh, if you need some time at home just to prepare some bread and some juice, please do so. But even more, uh, let's just take some time to make sure we have prepared our hearts to come to the Lord's table as well. Amen. Well, as we come to the communion table again this morning, it's again, it's a reminder of the salvation that we have in Christ and the sacrifice that he made on our behalf. And just as a reminder, you don't have to be a member of our church to, to take this meal with us. All you need is faith in Jesus Christ. 
and just the belief that he has died for your sins. And as we come and prepare our hearts this morning, Paul writes in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, he said, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Now the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father God, as we remember the broken body of our Savior, we remember the agony that he went through on the cross. We remember those nails that nailed our sins to the cross also had to pierce the flesh of our Savior. But Lord, we also remember that the suffering of Jesus is also the the exact same thing that, that leads to our wholeness now. That by His stripes we are healed. That through His suffering we can be made whole. That Lord, all that you had to go through, uh, Lord, all of your suffering was for a purpose. And that purpose was to offer us your salvation. Lord, as we come to take this bread, may we be mindful of the suffering and the sacrifice that you willingly took upon yourself so that we could be forgiven. We thank you for this as we come once again. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And Paul continues saying, in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's pray. Father God, as we take this cup, we do so with thankfulness. And yet, Lord, thankfulness almost seems too small a word when we consider how great a price is represented. That this cup represents the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That it represents the life that he set down so that we could find life in him. Lord, as your word says, without the Shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. And we understand that this was the cost. And yet, Lord, uh, may we just truly be mindful of how great a cost it was. And yet, Lord, may we also be mindful that it was a cost paid out of love for us. And that, Lord, we would truly know and understand how much love this cup represents. And that, Lord, if at any moment in all any of our lives, We were wondering how much love God has ever showed to us. May we only look at the cross to know that we are loved beyond our comprehension, even to fathom it. So Lord, thank you for this cup we are about to receive. Thank you for the life of your son, Jesus, that was laid down on our behalf. Thank you for the forgiveness of sin that was purchased through the shedding of his blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Then Paul writes that promise of hope for all of God's people saying, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Just want to thank you again for joining us this morning. As we go from here, I just, may we remember Christ. Remember his sacrifice and just remember the fullness of our salvation that is found 
in him. Amen. Yeah.